Today, who audits the auditors? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm joined by Robbie Barwick from the CC. Hi Robbie. Hi Martin. Great interesting conversation today because there is a bit of a discussion going on about those big auditing firms. There is. We, You and I discussed something like this back in uh, January or February I believe and there's been a there's been a, a a bubbling of scandal around these big four auditing firms for the last few years, especially in the UK, and it's spilled over here. We finally have an inquiry into the firms in Australia, and we need to make sure that inquiry is serious. Um, and why I say that is because uh, I think there are people in the major parties who are serious, but in general, the way the major parties tend to operate is because they're such they're so captive to vested interests. When something becomes too scandalous, they'll set up an inquiry and go through the motions so it looks like they've done something and have a mealy mouth report at the end like we saw with the Royal Commission effectively, and that's it. Um, we, and it's only heat from the public that's going to make them take it more seriously, and that's what we need to achieve with this inquiry. And it's called the um, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services. Now, Deb O'Neill is a Labor Party MP, she actually moved the notice of motion on this, and I'm 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 still not clear why uh, she has a particular interest in it, but I'm I'm glad she does. The 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 motion coincided though with the late the latest scandal involving Ken Henry, um, where Ken Henry uh, the, this whistleblower uh, that went to Adele Ferguson released all these these documents from Ernst and Young. NAB's auditor and Ken Henry had said to Ernst and Young in the middle of the Royal Commission, "Oh yeah, we're still selling products that we'll have to uh, make up for sometime in the future," and he didn't reveal that to the Royal Commission, and the auditor certainly didn't reveal that to anybody, right? And this only came out from this leak, and so that helped um, um, mo- motivate this Deb O'Neill to get this commission up and going, this inquiry up and going. Yeah. Okay. Right. So. Um it's worth, I think, just reflecting, you know, the big banks are very much um, uh, in cahoots with uh, the big auditing firms. They're all audited by those big organisations. Um, but it's funny how, you know, ANZ today came out with another half a billion uh, in, in terms of remediation costs from nowhere. Um, you know, just before the next results are due out at the end of October. Yeah. Um, so the process continues. And it seems to me that the um, disclosure processes and audit processes from those big firms are really just sadly wanting. No, they are. And, and it's become a structural problem at the heart of the financial system, right? And so what I've done here, we're, I'm just preparing a release that we're going to put out tomorrow about this encouraging people to make a submission. And let me say now, um, as I've said many times, but the the audience of DFA channel is highly qualified and I'm encouraging everyone who even has half an interest in this, please make a submission. There were 10, there's 10 submissions published so far on this inquiry's website. When you consider the importance of this issue, that's scandalous, that's terrible, right? We can't let this be ignored. Now, so not to distract from other campaigns we have on, like the cash ban, et cetera, but if you have a view on this, make a submission. Take the time, a page, 10 pages, whatever. Take the time to send a submission in and we'll provide the link below. But here's the, here are the things that have come out from these very uh, uh, groundbreaking inquiries, which are, which in a sense, it's stating the bleeding obvious, but it's, it's, it's all, it's all obvious. It is obvious now. So first of all, they, these big four firms are all private companies, but they have a guaranteed business. They are unique in the world. They have a guaranteed business because they, theirs is a state mandated function. Every corporation must be audited, right? And big corporations globally can only be audited by the big four because, and that includes all the big banks, etc. because only the big four are big enough to do it, right? So they control almost all the market. I've seen 99% in general. Richard Brooks's book, The Bean Counters, which is one of the best books on exposing them, 
he puts it at um, 97% of US public companies, 98% of Australia's, all of the UK's top 100 companies, and 80% of Japanese listed companies, right? That's the dominance of these four firms. Um, now, that would, I mean, that's already a problem as far as I'm concerned, that sort of dominance in four firms. That should never have been allowed to happen. But anyway, it has happened. But if they were boring accounting firms, um, uh, Richard, Richard uh, uses an easy, there was apparently a Monty Python skit years ago <laughs> where I'm you know, making fun of boring accountants. Hey, and by the way, I spent two years, st- I was going to be in a boring, a boring accountant once. Politics rescued me from that. <laughs> I, got, I got to leave, I, I, I couldn't stand it after two years and I left. Um, anyway, the, if they were boring accounting firms and did, did their auditing job, that's fine. But what's happened in recent decades, they've expanded into consultation often with the same firms that they're auditing. And straight away, you have a conflict of interest. But consultation has become massive for them. It's it's two-thirds of their income, at least now, over two-thirds, in fact. In the UK, it's four-fifths of their income is from consult- consultations, right? And so when they're, consult- when they're making more money from the firms they're auditing than they're consult- than they're, um, from consulting than audits, well, that's a huge temptation to go soft on the audits, and they do. They're not criticizing the companies. They're not they're not finding problems and going to the management and saying, you know, how's this, how's that? The boss of uh, H boss, Halifax Bank of Scotland was probably the most reckless lender in the UK before the global financial crisis. And when at, at the parliamentary inquiry that he fronted afterwards, he was asked about the auditing process and he said, Well, I used to sit with them after every audit. They gave me good advice, but they never criticized what we were doing, right? So this is the, you know, there's too much of this and you see it in the scandals. That's the main thing. There's been a litany of scandals where they've signed off on, on the books of corporations and banks that within, you know, weeks have gone under, belly up, right? So there's something structurally wrong and this is, this is the problem with this conflict of, um, of interest. Another thing that's starting to become obvious is their dominance to governments, to consulting to governments, Martin. And this this gets this gets really corrupt, to be honest. Um, uh, what what you know, governments have a public service to give them advice and to implement their programs, and that advice is in, is supposedly impartial. And you know, collectively, it's impartial. Each individual may have an agenda, but collectively, the the advice is impartial. Well, governments can get around that by consulting to these firms. And I'll, I'll, there's a chart we should put up from michaelwest.com.au, which, which shows the growth in the, in the government, federal government, Australian government's fees to these big four firms since 2012. It's gone from about a bit less than $300 million to over $700 million a year to the big four firms. Stunningly, half of that is to one department, which is the Department of Defence, where did Christopher Pine, the defence industries minister, go when he left Parliament? Right, Ernst and Young. You know, he made them a lot of money, right? Um, so this is scandalous. What 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 they've what they've done here by by you know by consulting to the big getting the big four to consult to them, the governments can basically pay for the advice they want, right? And this is so they they use it to the hilt. Um, and the big area is tax, right? These firms dominate. The global tax policy. These four firms, they just run it. In the UK, this report that we talked about at the start of the year, by that was commissioned by the UK Labor Party, reform in the auditing industry. The way they characterise it is the the partners. If I can read this great quote here, their partners, that is the big four partners, have colonised Her Majesty's Revenue Commission, colonised, and are permitted to write laws which ensure that they and their clients always win. And I think um, for the Treasurer Josh Frydenberg's panel, he's got this high-level advisory panel on taxation here in Australia. Something like 27 of the panel members are big four um, partners, right, or, or big four officials in, in one way or another. They just they just don't dominate this thing. They they write the laws. The UK controls more of these global offshore tax havens than any other country. They they these big four run that operation in a big way. They set it up. To, to be this looting machine that has, that has just every country is vulnerable to. That's why there's a really good book about it called The Pirates of the of um, uh, uh, Treasure Sorry Treasure Islands and comparing it to the Pirates of the Caribbean because they're in the Caribbean like the Cayman Islands, right? Um, Treasure Islands by Nicholas Jackson, and that's what they're, they're like pirates being able to raid countries 
and every country you know is in the same boat where they've got all these the the, the, the corporations they're trying to tax are based in these offshore jurisdictions and they can't touch them and they're all secret etc right it's a corrupt system and the big four are right in the middle of that that's the system we've got um this has one of the things I think has contributed to it here in Australia is the Royal Commission, where all this royal, all this misconduct. I mean, it was obvious, but all this misconduct, once it was proven to be misconduct at the Royal Commission, came out. Except the Greens had wanted to include the big four accounting firms in the terms of reference for the Royal Commission, because the question, you know, that you're finding all this misconduct. The question is, how did it get like this? Who wasn't who? Who was asleep at the switch? Well, we know the boards were, etc. But they have a process, and the, the process includes these audits, right? And um, Rob Ferguson, the former manager of BT, came out the other day. Um, well, well, last month he gave a, a lengthy interview to the Sydney Morning Herald, and he made the point that while you have this conflicted system, where the auditors are also consultants, they'll you'll never get proper audits from them. And we need to have a change in the way this system works to get proper audits if we want the system to work better, because they're never going to report back to management what management needs to know to run the companies. Mm, indeed. Well, they are on the same side rather than actually being, uh, if you like, uh, you know, checker and uh, and looker. They're basically thinking about it all the same way. And I'll give you sort of three examples from the finance sector, right? We know that the derivatives market has gone through the roof. You know, we know that there's a bigger derivatives exposure in the Australian banks than ever before. But I don't think anybody knows what the true status of those derivatives are. Um, why has it gone up so much? Well, probably because the banks are trading a lot more because they're making less out of their uh, uh, you know, lending operations. And this is another way of making money. But so what are the risks there and how are they actually translated? Nobody knows. Second one is that the big four banks all use the internal risk method for assessing yep. the risks in their loan portfolios. And the question is, well, who actually is checking those and making sure that those internal risk processes are appropriate and accurate? Because APRA certainly isn't. And I don't think the auditors of those banks are either. So that's another example. And a third one would be, um, just off the top of my head, what about the loan values uh, and how that relates to the property values in their mortgage portfolios? Because there have been very big movements in properties over the last um, two or three years, right? And in some cases, we know that properties are down 15, 20, 25, 30 percent. So if you translated the true value of property back into the mortgage portfolios, what would that do to those businesses, right? That's a Big and important question. And the final one, we know that in a situation where there is a slowdown in revenue generation, one of the tricks the banks can use is to keep zombie firms going and to keep basically zombie households going rather than actually calling them out as effectively you know, in default yeah. or uh, in yeah. risk of default, right? And, and this is something that the Bank for International Settlements uh, called out recently as one of the big phenomenons around the world. Lots of zombie firms out there. So... Who's looking at the zombie firms in the bank's books? Now, those are four things at least that I would have expected the auditors to be all over. But yeah. I can tell you they're nowhere near them. No, they wouldn't be touching it. And that's right there is the problem. If you, Martin North, you know, who is not an auditor, can, can be conscious of that, that is obviously what the, the bank should be doing. We've drafted a bill and audit the bank's bill to direct an audit of the banks to find out precisely those things you've just said. And we're, we're, we're working with politicians to get that bill introduced to Parliament. When it is, it's going to freak out the auditors and the banks, etc. But it needs to because they need to know that, that, that um, um, you know, there's, there's people are, are becoming wise to them. I'm hoping it gets introduced while this, while this inquiry is underway, right, so that um, it can both tee off the inquiry but also give teeth to the inquiry so we can get it, so we can make sure it just, just doesn't become going through the motions. And we based it on our knowledge of the outcome of the 1937 Banking Royal Commission, which at the time, because, um, because uh, as John Adams points out, the first ever bail-in of a bank, of banks, was in Australia in the 1890s, and it was a disaster, but all these depositors lost their money for a long time. Um, the, the banking culture in Australia for the first or well, most of the last century was very much based around the sanctity of deposits, right? Protecting deposits at all costs. And so in the 1937 Banking Royal Commission, 
the, the, the Royal Commission final report acknowledged that the government, the Australian government, is the backstop to make sure the deposits are protected. And if it's going to do that properly, it needs to know what's in those bank, in the bank's books, right? Therefore, it has the right to conduct an audit whenever it seems necessary of the bank's books using the Auditor General, not a private auditor, using the Auditor General. And until the APRA Act was written, that requirement was in every banking law in Australia for the next 60 years or so, until the APRA Act was written. When the APRA Act was written, APRA was again has the right to audit the banks, but it wasn't required to use the Auditor General. And who's it used? The big four accounting firms. When APRA does its stress tests, who's involved in those stress tests? The big four accounting firms, right? And when you go through the conflicted model I've just described, it cannot work. And and as you as you've just said, all those things they're obviously they're not just they're not it's not they're missing them they're looking the other way, right? Um, the banks don't want anyone to look at their off balance sheet stuff where all this derivatives is, right? That's you know, I had a, actually I had a, a, an accountant who worked at who used to work at a big four firm recently challenged me so you can't blame the big four because they're just they're just looking to make sure the banks are following proper accounting methods. Right. Well, that, that that that's his excuse. You know, they're not they're not looking at those things. Well, that is the problem, right? We need a system that can look at those things, and these four cannot do it. We're not talking about, you know, admit there's a certain things that obviously have to be done. You've got to split the one call is to break the big four up. You know, one another thing is what we've said. Let's get the auditor general back. Rob Ferguson, the former manager of BT, said the same thing. The auditor general should be required to audit these banks. In the UK, the Labor Party there that did this report, they've said we need a statutory auditor like the Auditor General for the for this. Um, but you got to ha you have to have a permanent structure that can do the job, and that starts with recognising how poorly equipped these big four accounting firms are. They are the the structural backbone of the corruption in the system, unfortunately. Right? They are the common thread that links it all: corruption, misconduct, um, reckless behaviour. They cover for it all. Everyone assumes they're that they're overseeing it, and they're not. And that's this that's the the nub of the issue right there. What needs reform? But we need people who have views on this. Make it known, right? Write a letter, write a, a submission in the form of a letter or whatever, however de detailed you want it to be, um, to do that. I'm encouraging if you're involved in the cash ban fight, it's the same thing, right? Because we know that the legislation as you and John did on that show recently when the legislation was introduced, the legislation is now focused on the tax side of things. Well, fine. The answer to that is this recommendation came from KPMG. You want to, if the federal government wants more tax revenue, go after the big four auditing firms. Don't go and ban cash on people, right? They, they, they are the common thread in all this. So let's hit them on this, on this inquiry. Uh, on, on, on the auditing in, in particular, get involved in that and also uh, hit them a second, time, a second time in your submission on the cash ban. Right. And just to be clear, there is a closing date for submissions to this um, auditor review, right, which is a couple of weeks. 28th of October. Yep. 28th 20... of October for this. So 15th of November for the cash ban. Yep. So you have time to do both. And please yep. do both. I yep. mean, you might think, well, we you know, Oh, there's a lot to do. Well, you don't get these. A whole bunch of opportunities may have come at once, right? And and but they don't come often enough. So, yep. so, so seize well, them, take advantage of it. You know, we got four thousand submissions for the for the previous one, right? So so you know, it would be possible to get you know a quantum bigger than they've currently got for, for this auditor. This is this is really really important, right? Because this is where the rubber actually hits the road. And you know, fair disclosure, years ago I worked inside one of those big um, accounting and audit firms, right? And I was astonished at the attitude inside those firms, which is basically they'll do anything, they'll sell their grandmother to make money, right? There is not a moral bone in my view, in a number of these organizations, they will do anything, right? They'll run over backwards, they'll, you know, whatever it takes, right? So, so there is a critical issue here, not just of economics, but also of morality, right? Yeah, yeah. And it seems to me that this is a great opportunity to underscore again, the importance of truth, the importance of actually doing the right thing and not just rolling over for commercial purposes. Yep. And I'm starting to just realize that, you know, one of the things we have to do in the financial system is root out conflicts of interest. 
you got to break up the big banks so there's not a conflict of interest between the, the interest of depositors and and the management and speculators etc you got to break up these big auditing firms so there's not this conflict these conflicts of interest don't work they can never manage them they say they manage them. they don't manage them right um and and the disasters are are, are evident so it's it's you know um reform for the sake of the economy, for the sake of economic justice, for the sake of, 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 of having an honest system, it's got to be reformed and the people have to demand that. Well, I can tell you one other thing. Despite the so-called Chinese walls that are meant to be within the audit and advisory functions, right, I can tell you that from my direct experience, they weren't working. They would all yep. sit around the table across those uh, party divides, across the, the firewalls, and basically plot and scheme and hatch that's the way it's done and uh, therefore again you know it's critical that this is actually brought into the light and we get some changes here because if we do get those changes we can begin to uh, you know move the country in a better direction in terms of the quality of information around the banks um, the quality of the policy making decisions that are being taken so it's really really important so make a submission 28th of october is the deadline and we'll put the links below yeah that's very good thanks man Good. Thanks, Robbie. Appreciate your time once again. Keep campaigning, All eh? Right. Keep it up. Yep. <laughs> See you later. Thanks. Bye.